So today, we are kicking off a new teaching series that we'll be in for a little bit called Family Matters. Um, for those of you that are over the age of 28, um, I have been asked multiple times why we are not using the logo from the show. For those of you that are under the age of 28, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You can Google it later. Um, the answer is copyright infringement. So this is our, <laughs> this is what we're doing. Um, but the, the idea behind the series is pretty, pretty simple. There are two things at play that make family difficult. First is ignorance of what God intends for it. And second is the, um, the constant railing against what God intends for it. So we happen to be in the middle of both of those. We've never been in a more biblically ignorant time as a nation, and we've never been in, a, in an environment that was more acrid for the biblical family than we are as a nation right now. And so we're, we're doing this series for, for two reasons. One, uh, for multiple reasons. One, we want to support you guys who are moms and dads and have kids and stuff. And the second is we want to support you guys who are going to be moms and dads and have kids and stuff, which is statistically most of you. And then third, we want to talk about how we as a church, filled not mostly with moms and dads and kids and stuff, can support and, and step into the calling to be both a spiritual family and lend our faith and lend our love and lend our support to those who are putting families back together. That's one of the reasons why we love supporting Orphan Network. We think that it's such a cool ministry that, that we basically get to partner with local organizations that, um, that are helping families do what families do in, a, in an environment that's really, really hard. Um, so thank you guys for your continued support for that. Today, we're going to look at the template. Today, we're looking at what God seems to have intended behind this thing called family. And in order to do that, we'll be in Genesis chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, I would love for you to turn there with me and read. And we'll pray. And God is going to speak to us through his holy word. Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and, every, <clears throat> and brought them to him, uh, to the man, to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper found fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And then the man said, this at last. Is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Holy Spirit, Please come and fill me. Please come and fill my friends in the room. Please come and speak to us and teach us, Lord. Today as we look at what you made family for, help us to get a vision for what you want our families to be. Lord, would you help us to get faith to see what our children and grandchildren could become? And Holy Spirit, would you minister to us wherever we're coming from? Lord, I recognize many of us are coming to this topic from many different places. And I thank you that before you, there is no shame. But before you, there is change. So God, change me. Change us. Help us to see today. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I think I have not experienced more spiritual warfare around a teaching series than I have around this one in 
recent memory. The, from, the, from the moment we, we felt from the Holy Spirit to do this series this year, to this very week, to last evening, <laughs> to uh, like when my sleep was interrupted, like there, there, is, uh, there is some uh, pushback I'm feeling against this. Moreover, I personally find talking about this hard, and here's why. Because what we're about to look at and what we're going to talk about today is God's vision for family. It's like the the template. And whenever we see the template that God has for something, God's perfect version of it, then we become pretty quickly aware of the fact that we aren't that, right? We become pretty quickly aware of the fact that whatever God's perfect standard for a thing is, we're not that. And I got to tell you that as a man who comes from uh, a almost artistically broken family, and as a man who has not been the perfect husband or the perfect dad himself, I want you to know that what we're about to talk about is not coming from a place of, hey, I got this right, so do what I say. In fact, I think it's the Lord's hilarious irony that he seems to have me talk about things that I like, am bad at and then get better at <laughs> so that I can maybe relate to those of you who can re- relate to not being perfect. Is that anyone in the room? <laughs> so if you were hoping to hear today about how to have a perfect family from a perfect husband and a perfect dad, I'm, you were going to be very disappointed. <laughs> However, today there is hope for all of us because here we're going to see God's vision for whole and holy families. And what we're going to find is that God's vision for whole and holy families doesn't just tell us what to do or hold up a standard for us, but gives us a vision for what could be possible in any family by his grace and mercy. Amen? So here we find the template for everything. Genesis 1, Genesis 2 is, is, the, is the part of your Bible that's giving you the, the this is how things ought to be part, okay? And it's uh, terribly short because pretty much the rest of your Bible, except the very last chapter, is what God has been doing to make things as they should be after we ruin them in sin. But here we, we get God's vision for the family. Now you should say uh, knows that Genesis tells the creation story kind of in a, in a one-two cycle. Genesis 1 um, doesn't precede the events of Genesis 2. They're telling the same sort of events over and atop one another. And so here we get, we get a very human-centered version of the creation story where we've got God putting his hands in dirt and forming the first man out of the dirt. The word for that man is Adam. Means dirt. I don't know what your name means. Hopefully it means something really inspiring, (laughs) really encouraging. My name means dirt. So (laughs) so God, God took this clay figure, this dirt man, and breathed into this thing. And it became a human, the first man. And God was like, this is pretty good. And so God gave this first human a a job. And and that's where we pick up the story. When God made Adam, we, we read right here in verse 15, he took the man, the human, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Now, the Garden of Eden, you have to understand, isn't just like, a garden as you might think of a garden. Like, like we have a small garden behind our house. It has like cucumbers and lettuce and weeds, and we're great at growing all three. Um, th- we're, not, we're not talking about like a, like a square foot garden. We're, we're talking about a, a place of verdant growth because that place is also the place where God lives. You need to think about a beautiful place at the top of a mountain where the space that God inhabits, and the space that we inhabit is the same space. This is, uh, has caused some like, biblical theologians to call 
Eden, like the garden sanctuary or the garden temple, because it was not only the place where humans were put to be, you know, amazing and to, and to enjoy God's presence, but it was also the place where God lived, which is going to be a really important theme for everything that comes after this moment. So God puts Adam in this special garden sanctuary, garden temple thing. And God's there, and, and nature is there, and, and God, God looks at this human and he says, cool, but it's not good that he's alone. Now, before he, he does this, he gives him a, a rule, the one rule that you probably are familiar with. Look, you can eat anything, anything but that. Don't, don't eat from that tree, the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And the man was like, got it. And then God puts him to work, to guard and to keep, or to work and to keep this particular garden. But then he says something really interesting. Verse 18, he says, It is not good that the man should be alone. Now here I usually make a joke about single men. <clears throat> and it goes like this, if you've ever known a single man, then you know God was right. It's a funny joke. I've been making it for years. Um, and it mostly holds true. But there's something really, really interesting inside that funny little verse because technically speaking, Adam wasn't alone. Like, technically speaking, Adam was with God. And like, technically, technically speaking, he was with God in like a more with God, intimate, close, physical way than any of us. Save for maybe Jesus when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, okay? Like he was with him, like we are with each other in this room. So isn't it weird that, that the writer of Genesis should, should have God saying, okay, this part, this isn't good. We just got done hearing how good creation was. Seven times it was good in, at the end of chapter one, okay? And so when God repeats himself seven times, it's, it's, a really, it's, it's God clapping in your face and it was really good. And so the, the only thing that isn't good is that this human is, is alone, but he's not alone. God is there and the animals are there. And so God notices this. It's not good that this man is alone. I'm going to make a helper fit for him. Let's go name the animals. That's the very next thing that happens. Why, why is it that the next thing that happens isn't the creation of Eve? The next thing that happens is that Adam begins to name all the animals. Now, this has a lot of significance. The first is the fact that Adam is speaking like words of definition, just like God spoke words of definition. Adam is bringing order to what might be a chaotic natural world, just like God was bringing order to a, what was a chaotic world. So like, like there's some ways that, that Adam is sort of stepping into his, his vice regency or his role as this garden temple priest, if you like. Cool, okay, okay. But he gets through the natural world. You know, I don't, I don't know what he named everything, fish, bird, duck, other duck. You know, I don't know. But he gets to the end, and it says this. Yes. There was not a helper found fit for him. No, nowhere amongst the animals, no, nowhere in, in all of creation, and nowhere even in the throne room of heaven was there found a helper fit for him. So God said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do something really cool. And so he puts Adam to sleep, and he takes this rib out of Adam, and from this rib he forms... A woman. Now, this has all kinds of really cool, poetic, interesting significance. Not the least of which is this. God made from the human another human that was both like him and totally different than him to complete him. Th think about this. God made from the man this being that, that's like him, but also not like him, in order to complete this, this whole project of both bringing Adam help, companionship, and doing the work of guarding and keeping the garden. And back in Genesis 128, where he said, you know, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. It's, it's very difficult for one human to do that alone. And so, so God, in his genius creates for Adam this partner 
to come alongside him. Now here before, and like we have any, and this is all the introduction, so I hope that you don't have lunch plans. That, I mean, you like grub hubbing in or something for the fifth point. A- Adam, from Adam comes this other creature, this woman, who's not made from a bone from his head, as if to rule over him, nor made from a bone from his foot, as if to be domineered by him, but, but by a bone that's like really close to his heart, right, right here, near the center of him, to come beside him. I say all of this to say, in God's template here, whole and holy families start with a whole and holy marriage, with whole and holy parents, two people, a man and a woman, who are alike in that they are human, and and they're oriented toward God, and they're in relationship with God, but not alike in that they are, well, they're a man and a woman, and there we have a whole, like, human history of ways we're not alike. (laughs) To come together and create something new and beautiful. Now, right here, I already feel this little uh, little gremlin in my in my head, um, talking to me about how how much I, I don't map on to the the perfect version of a dude, and how how my family my my marriage isn't fully whole or holy. And so, if you like me, when we go through this, are gonna feel at times like, oh, that's I, I can't relate to that, or oh that really you know, triggers this memory, or, oh, I find this really painful to talk about. Listen, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Over the next few minutes, I want you to suspend all that stuff for just a bit. Because what we're going to do is we're going to look at God's intention for the family, intention, so that we can come and experience redemption toward it, not so that we can experience shame for not being it. You hear me? So, whole and holy families begin with whole and holy parents. L- listen to some of the things that the author of Genesis notes about this. The first thing that he notes is that there's this companionship. That, that the creation of Eve was meant to bring companion. It's not good that this human should be alone. And so God makes another human, both alike and different, in order to bring companionship. Whole and holy marriages are marked by companionship. I hope that you are married to your best friend. I am. I think Hope would say that too, but I am. (laughs) Some of you have noticed that she's not here. That's because there are sick people in our home. Okay, we didn't fight before this, just so you know. Um, (laughs) She'll be in the next service. Adam needed companionship. Whole and holy parents are companions to one another. Another thing to note here is that they're marked by helping one another. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to keep it, and God brought alongside Adam a helper fit for him, and part of the fit for him wasn't just to bring him like emotional support, but was actually also to accomplish the work of being in the garden sanctuary and doing what they were called to do. Now, here is typically where an objection comes up. Wait, I don't like it, Pastor Adam, that the woman is called a helper. Right? You feel that? You bunch of liars. You do too feel it. Yeah, of course you do. Like, that just sounds very regressive, Pastor Adam. That doesn't, you know, why, why isn't the man? Before you get upset, you should know something. That this word, helper, in Hebrew, do you know who it most often describes in the Bible? <laughs> well, God. But yes, the Holy Spirit more in the, in the New Testament. But, but God, in, I mean, all throughout The Old Testament, the stories, the the Psalms are, God is my helper. And so what this cannot possibly mean is that helper is is somehow like, you know, like um, servant, um, you know, low on the totem pole to be bossed around. No, 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 no. This is before the fall, remember? This is before sin. This is a compliment. This is a helper. And if we don't like the word helper, then we got a problem with God. Because that is how he often describes himself to us. That is what was needed in this moment. Whole and holy families begin with whole and holy parents because they they help each other. There was a mission for the family. They help each other accomplish the mission. Today, 
marriage has been, like the mission of marriage has been reduced to emotional and sexual fulfillment, right? And so if someone fulfills you emotionally and sexually, then you should marry them. And when they cease to do that, you should unmarry them and perhaps go and marry someone who does do that and do this throughout your life until you can no longer do this. That is currently how marriage seems to work in our culture. Now, we, we cover that over with like, oh, I fell in love, I fell out of love, as though love is like a cup that someone's scooping you up and dumping you out of again, or a trap <laughs> that you just fell into, like a bear trap. I fell in love. If you think about it, it's a weird thing to say. Like, we fall in sin and we fall in love. I can't think of anything else we fall into. Traps, pools. <laughs> Falling into things is generally not a good thing, is what I'm saying. Usually results in pain. I would stop saying I fell in love if I were you. I might say, like the Song of Solomon says, I found the one my heart loves. I found the one my heart loves. When we got married, Hope had that etched on the inside of my wedding band. I found the one my heart loves. Whole and holy families start with whole and holy parents who love each other, they're companions to one another, and they're on board for the mission of God. Now here, the mission of God was work and keep the garden temple, and be fruitful and multiply. In other words, expand the borders of this thing. Like, let's reproduce godliness and holiness in, in the world. That was the, that was the job. That was the goal. And then to take God's word and speak it forth, God's ways, and live them forth. That, that's what they were there to do. They were there to found a whole and holy society that began in their whole and holy family. Now, that has all kinds of political implications, by the way. But we won't get into those today. They also celebrate one another. I love this. What was Adam's first response when he saw his wife? He sang, gentlemen. <laughs> gentlemen, <laughs> may I suggest, this is a good start, <laughs> if you can sing. But she might find it cute even if you can't. The first thing he did was go, at la why at last? Because he had just gotten done naming all of the animals. Going, no, 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 a giraffe? We, no, no, duckbill, platypus, God. Anyway, no, no. And so finally, he goes, at last. Every man of God that I've ever met, when he sees his wife, has that same experience. <sighs> at last. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. I'll call her woman because she was taken out of man, what, what's going on here is this wonderful encapsulation of, and, and the crowning of all of Adam's observation of all of creation, that nothing God made compares to the woman God made for him. It's beautiful. They sing to one another. They praise one another. They celebrate one another, and they hold fast to one another. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and, they shall, and he shall hold fast to his wife. This word, Hold fast, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's aggressive, it's cling. It's like you do not let go. It is your kung fu grip. And the two shall become one flesh. I've said this before, but the, the, what we're translating here is one flesh is again a very strong statement because it's the same kind of way the people of Israel would later describe God. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That idea of God's oneness is to be what is the measuring rod for a marriage. And it's oneness. That something spiritual and something cosmic and something beautiful happens in the way that they are connected and committed. The word covenant comes to mind. And I love this. And they were unashamed. The man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. Oh man. Now naked, obviously like without clothing. I think that, that's got to mean so much more. Without sin, there was nothing about me that I was afraid was going to get rejected by her. And there was nothing about her that she was afraid was going to be rejected by me. That's what it means to be naked and unashamed, where, where Adam was fully known and fully knew. And Eve was fully known and fully knew. And because there was no shame, there was no fear that my definition of good, right, true, and beautiful might be different than your definition of good, right, true, and beautiful. And when those definitions don't meet, then maybe you'll think part of me is ugly or part of me is unsavory. Or part, like, 
There was no fear of that because there was no shame and sin. So they were as together as it is possible to be with no shame. Now again, if you hear that, maybe the gremlin in the back of your head is like, oh, well, that's not your life. Oh, well, that's not your marriage. That'll never be your marriage. Listen, I want you to suspend all that because what we're learning first is the template, right? I'm just going to keep saying that to you. We're seeing the template. Whole and holy families begin with whole and holy marriages. And they follow God above anyone else. Now, perhaps it is at this point that you're thinking, okay, but Pastor Adam, there are, there are those in the church that are called to be single. Uh, and, and what about other forms of marriage that our, our culture is talking about? What about, what about same-sex marriage? What about, what about multiple partners? What about all that stuff like that, that it seems to be gaining? Okay, again, we will talk about all those things. You're going to have to come back next week. But today, we're, before we can talk about those things, we need to talk about what God intended for this to be. Otherwise, we might resist a thing in culture, but not know why. And then just come off as jerks. It's one thing to say something is wrong, but it's another thing to say why this is so right. I would rather you be more beautiful and formed in whole and holy marriage than you are ready to give an apologetic account for those marriages which are not. Beauty is very compelling. So is holiness. So whole and holy families start with whole and holy parents who then create whole and holy children. One of my marriage mentors said this, and it has stuck with me. The very best thing that any, any parents can give their children is a great marriage between each other. The number one thing that I can give Alana, Nora, Cole, and Wyatt is the best marriage that I can have with my wife, Hope. What happens often is that when we get kids, they become the center of the marriage. And now they're the most important thing in the world. And they arise. And then we, we install ourselves into a new form of government called kindergarten. <laughs> right? Where perhaps you live in this form of government and the revolt is due. Whereby everything in the family centers on this child and must be moved by this child. And if the child isn't happy, if the child isn't good, if the child and everything about the child, the child becomes the sun, and you, my friends, become planets. Some of you become exoplanets. You know? And I would say that that's not, that is not. God didn't start with kiddos like that. Whole and holy families begin with whole and holy parents who create whole and holy children, parents who are friends help foster kids who are friends. Parents who work together and serve one another help foster kids who work together and serve one another. Parents who affirm and celebrate one another help foster kids who affirm and celebrate one another. Parents who are deeply devoted to God help foster kids that are deeply devoted to God. Now, again, I know what some of you are thinking. Okay, but wait. What about my child who's not where I want them to be with Jesus? Or what about, what about my spouse who seems to be struggling? Or what about my former spouse who just like lost the plot and left? I cannot describe to you in words how much compassion I have for each of those situations. I understand. But before we get there, just from, we're looking at the template, right? That God's intention was that whole and holy families are made by whole and holy parents who create whole and holy children. Now, why is this so important? I mean, I, I thought about just getting up here like a ton of quotations, you know, and, and footnotes about why parents, families with a mom and a dad present without divorce are so important. But you can Google those. There is an unbelievable amount of research and meta-research and repeated research about how children who are born into families where mom and dad are married and mom and dad remain married for the time of that child's raising are less likely to be in poverty, are less likely to die of disease, are more likely to live longer, will uh, have higher mental health outcomes when they grow up. I mean, it's just everything, literally every measurable is better. Now, that's not to say that if you came from a single 
Emily Holm, or if you're a single parent, that God doesn't have grace for you. I'm simple. We're looking at the template that God seems to have made a thing to work a certain way. And when we as a culture, as we have been experimenting with the next generation for the last 60 years, begin to deconstruct the thing that God made, we should not be all that surprised when our deconstruction also deconstructs the next generation. Like, what did we think was going to happen? There's an epidemic of fatherlessness. Well, what do you know? Now there's a generation of men who have achieved less than the previous generation of men who are more addicted to porn and video games than they are working in the world and blessing the people that they're supposed to be blessing and acting like Adam was meant to act. That is tragic, but it should not be surprising. Whole and holy families begin with whole and holy parents who raise whole and holy children. My friends, moms and dads, may I recommend to you that wholeness and holiness are more important for your kids than a nice neighborhood. They're more important to your kids than that super posh private school. They are more important than how much money you make. They are more important than the car you drive. The kinds of things that lead the next generation to wholeness and holiness are not necessarily the same kinds of things that make us happy as parents. I'll leave you to determine what that means, but I wonder if moms and dads, when we sit around and we think about like what's going to help the next generation, and you who are single, when you sit around and think about the kind of family you might want to have one day, is the filter wholeness and holiness for the next generation, or is the filter something else? Because if it's something else, I would submit to you, this should definitely make it into the matrix of decisions. Finally, whole and holy families Start with whole and holy parents who create whole and holy children. Why? To bring healing to a broken and hurting world. God created family as a way to bless the world. Again, let's go back to this picture. They were naked. They were not ashamed. They'd been given God's law, and they were at this point obeying it. They were in right relationship with God. They were in his presence constantly, and they were given a mission of multiplying the next generation and expanding the borders of the kingdom of God. Now, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that that did not go well. That eventually our first parents believed the lie of God's enemy, did what God asked them not to do, thinking that they knew better than God, and in so doing, unleashed hurt and pain and sin and sadness and brokenness and disease and death upon their generations. So now, we find, we find that it's kind of hard to do family. We find that it's kind of hard to be whole and holy families because it's kind of hard to be whole and holy parents who raise whole and holy kids. That's exceedingly difficult because sin is now within us, within them, and all around us. Yeah, you do know that your children are sinners, right? Some of you, you just had children, and you're like, this one? No. Listen, they just don't have motor control yet. <laughs> <laughs> they can't rebel. Give them a second, <laughs> right? Let them stretch it out and warm it up, you know? Because come about three, you're going to be like, oh, total depravity. Yeah, yeah. Sin, it's right there. It's weird. I never had to teach my kids how to have a tantrum. Never at once was I like, all right, step one, hit the floor. Step two, bang. Like, I never had to do that. But I did have to teach them how to be, like, loving, kind, patient. Any other parents notice this? Just, or is it just my genes? Okay. It's hard right now because sin is embedded in the world within us and the world around us. So what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, here... Adam and Eve messed it up. They did. And here we mess it up too. I am 100% certain that when my parents became pregnant with my sister and I, they probably had every good intention in the world. Like they're not, even before they knew Christ, they're not just like sociopaths, right? They probably wanted things to go well. 
And I'm pretty sure that their parents wanted things to go well. And I'm pretty sure that their parents, I'm pretty sure that the problem was not ever a desire for things to go well for the next generation. I'm pretty sure it must be deeper and more insidious than that. The problem is sin. And so now when I come to a topic like this, and maybe when you come to a topic like this, and you hear someone like me say that family is meant to be whole and holy with parents that are whole and holy, who bring children into the world that are whole and holy, you both are encouraged by that. And then you go, oh no. Because I am not whole and holy. Yeah. And if you're coming to that realization, then you're right next to the thing you need most, which is grace and mercy to be made holy and whole. I was praying about a year ago, and I mean, I've prayed since then. Um, <laughs> like I should put that out. Uh, but it was one of those prayers, it, it was angry praying. You ever angry pray? Okay, well, I'll teach you sometime. It, it was angry praying, you know, and it was, not, uh, it was not on my knees and, oh, Lord, you know, what's thou? It was on my feet stomping and, and reminding God, like, you said this and you said this and I don't see this and what's going on? And I was just, I, there were some things going on in my family, in my extended family, and I was like, God, I just... I don't understand how in the state that things are in, I I, I can move on with, with so much brokenness. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, I have the most broken family in the world. And I was like, and he was like, no, no, Adam, think about it. I adopted you. All of my children have rebelled, every one of them, except one. And him, he had to die so that I could adopt a bunch of rebels. No one's family is more broken than the family of God. So I thought, oh, okay. So when we encounter brokenness, in our families. Now, this is really important that you get this. And when you see brokenness in your, in your parents, in your grandparents' generation, when you see it in yourselves, and if you see it in your children, I want you to remember that only God's family can be made perfect. And brokenness in your family is not a sign that you are without grace. It is simply the qualification for needing it. You hear me? When you encounter things in your own family line, like there are a lot of you who are single in this room, and you can think of things mom and dad did to you. You're like, man, that wasn't right. There's grace that God can give to you that not only heals whatever might have happened to you, but allows you to be an agent of redemption to them who raised you. Culture says, oh, you got to blame everything on mom and dad and then do whatever the opposite of what they did, you know, in the next generation, which has never worked. It's just created this sort of ping pong of ways we will break the next generation. But you, children, can be an agent of redemption for families. Parents, you can be an agent of redemption to your children. Do you realize that whole and holy families isn't something that God is holding up to you saying, if you don't do this, I won't accept you. It's something God is holding up to you that says, if you will let me have grace on you, then you can approximate this. And I want to redeem what's happened in your family line and help you become whole and holy. My friends, the struggle in marriage, the struggle in being pure until marriage, the struggle to raise whole and holy kids, the struggle to be a Christian in the world that does not give you any bonus points for trying to do so is not one that that is without purpose. There is a goal in mind. The goal in mind is to heal a hurting and broken world. God healed a hurting and broken world through a family, namely his own. So our perfect elder brother Jesus comes and undoes all of what Adam did and heals all of what Eve broke and brings all of that Shame and sadness and sin and brokenness and disease into himself. 
and receives the full weight of all of it, all of our selfishness, all of our sadness, all of our arguments, all of our rebellion. And that death that God promised that Adam would experience was ultimately embraced by Christ so that the life and the purpose for which God made humanity may ultimately be experienced by us. Did you catch that? Like, this gives me hope as a dad. This gives me hope as a husband. This gives me hope as a pastor, which is just an old English word for shepherd, fatherly shepherd. Ah! That, that God not only wants to hold up this, this image of a family as like this thing that's perfect and I'll never have. No, God wants to hold up this image as a family as this thing that is my once and future destiny if I will receive the grace and mercy of Jesus. Because I gotta tell you, the future, it's a big old family. We're not radical individuals in the kingdom of heaven. We are instead children of our one true and perfect father. So, today, maybe you're hearing this and you're like, yo, my family of origin was awesome. And, like, things are going awesome as I pursue a spouse, or things are going awesome as I, you know, look forward to raising kids, or things are going awesome as I enter into the grandparent years. May I say to you, praise God. And you have a profound responsibility you have a profound responsibility to teach the rest of us and to help the rest of us and disciple the rest of us. I remember the first time I saw a whole and holy family, I felt like I discovered a new tribe. Like I was on a nature show, like, you know, just peeled back some bushes and there was a, like a table and they were eating around it and they were happy. And I was like, this, is a, this can't be. You have a responsibility to have some of us in your home. You have a responsibility to love on those new moms and dads. You have a responsibility to disciple those college students. You've got a responsibility to take what is whole and holy in your house, out of your house. And for those of you who maybe you're looking at your family of origin or the family that you're in right now, and you're like, woo, I would not necessarily use the adjectives whole or holy to describe this. I have great news for you. God has mercy. Big enough, deep enough, wide enough to heal all of your pain and your wounds. God has power great enough, strong enough, and rich enough to make you into a great mom. Make you into a great dad. To make you into a great son and a great daughter. Because God wants whole and holy families to bless a broken and hurting world. Maybe some of you are in here and you're like, man, my family, my family needs help. Please let us know. We actually, uh, in, to, to, uh, to equip some of you, we've actually got on, on the webpage, front of the webpage right now, and we're creating a static document, is a, is a library of resources for parents. And even the curriculum that we teach your kids is designed to be taken home with you. But if you need more help, if you're like, look, our marriage is struggling, our family, I don't know what to do with my children. Friends, that's not something you're to sit in shame inside your home with. That's something that you're to bring into the family of God and say, I need help with it. Your pastor's done that. All of your pastors have done that. And maybe you're sitting here and saying, okay, I, I don't have that, but I want that. The, the beginning of it begin, starts by receiving mercy from a whole and holy Savior. Our whole and holy Jesus is more than enough to impart wholeness and holiness to you. And so today, as we approach this topic and as we embark on this teaching series, I want you to hear a couple of things. Don't sit in shame and disengage in this series. Single people, don't tap out because you're like, oh, this isn't relevant to me. Oh, statistically, it will be. And it is right now because we all have a responsibility to support the families in this church. We all have a responsibility to support the marriages in this church and the children in this church and the grandchildren in this church. Oh, yes. Because we are a spiritual family. And a whole and holy family is given to bless a broken and hurting world. Holy Spirit, help us, God, to be whole, to be holy. 
Lord, I pray, God, for those marriages and families that are doing great. Lord, thank you. Praise God. Lord, may the richness and the glory and the goodness of those families and those marriages be imparted into this house to the third and fourth generation. And Lord, I know that there are some marriages and families that are in here struggling. Lord, there, there are divorces. Lord, there's abuse. God, there's abandonment. God, there's rebellion. Then there is pain. Lord, I thank you that today as we look at the template and we see the gap between us and it, we now see this space for your grace. So God, I pray for my friends in here who, who have things they want you to do in their family, Lord, that you'd bring healing. God, that over the next few weeks as we dwell upon whole and holy families, Lord, that you would cause us as a church to foster them. God, I thank you that in the coming months, we're going to hear about healed marriages. Lord, I thank you that in the coming months, we're going to hear about newly saved children and wayward ones coming home. God, I thank you that in the coming months, we're going to hear stories about children who act as agents of redemption for their parents and grandparents. Lord, we love you. 